Hello, and welcome to the Decode podcast. Uh, here we talk all things headless WordPress and modern web development. And we are back in your ears this week uh, with another great episode. We're going to talk all about rendering patterns um, on the web. Uh, I'm Kellen Mace, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Will Johnston. Hi, Will. Hey. And we have on with us today a guest um, that we work with uh, closely at WP Engine, Alex Moon. How's it going, Alex? Hey, Kellen. It's going well. Glad to be here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Glad to have you here. This is going to be a, a cool conversation. So uh, before we dive too deep into the rendering stuff, uh, just let folks know kind of who, who you are and what you do in a nutshell. Yeah. Uh, so obviously my name is Alex, as has been said, I work here at WP Engine uh, as a solutions architect. So I, I work a lot with uh, our customers, helping them understand uh, what it looks like to build uh, headless sites on WordPress and the solutions we provide. Very nice. And you've been in that space for um, quite a while, right? I think it was like, was it four years prior to this? You did a lot of, a lot of work with um, Gatsby, you know, which is a very common platform to pair with Headless CMSs, of course. And yeah, that's kind of where WP I got my, my start in this space in Jamstack world and um, website development was Gatsby. And I've, I've been active in the open source community there. I, I worked for Gatsby for a stint, um, working on their data layer and different things. So yeah, mm -hmm. long history here. Well, very cool. Yeah, so some past episodes, uh, our listeners may, um, may be reminded of as we walk through this stuff, like we've done past episodes on... Um, uh, Next.js versus Gatsby and talked about some of the methods there that, that th those two frameworks in particular do for rendering. Um, and so some of these, you know, terms you might've heard before on the podcast, but uh, for this episode, we thought we would go back to the beginning and just talk about what do we mean when we use that term like rendering, and then what are the different types of rendering that are out there, like from the uh, early days of the web through to now where we have these, you know, modern applications running in the browser. What are the types of rendering that are out there and just pros and cons and uh, just geek out on, on that stuff for, for a little bit. So we'll start with that definition. Like Alex, I know you've done some writing on this. Um, you're, you're considering, you know, doing a blog post soon on, on a, a topic like this. So um, what's your take on like that word rendering and how it's used or maybe how it's abused? <laughs> yeah, there's um yeah, so like I think the first thing, uh, maybe especially people that focus on what's happening in the browser, think about rendering, right? Is there think about like uh, when the browser pulls in that HTML document and it correlates that brings in the CSS and the JavaScript and it's it's dumping that all into the DOM and it's actually rendering that image, right? Uh, but there's like a whole nother aspect of it. Like we have the term server side rendered. Well, you can't like no matter what happens, like that step we just talked about is always happening in the DOM. So there's some other kind of rendering that's happening here. Right. Um, and the question is like, how do we define that? Is that uh, generating CSS and HTML and JavaScript? Is it generating the, the correct pictures that happens in someone's you know, Photoshop? Right? Like what aspect of that? And at least where mm -hmm. I've come to it is like, all we can really talk about is the HTML. That's like the core aspect of uh, the rendering stage, because like oh, it's WordPress, for example, right? It can render CSS on request, right? It can create that document on request, but most of the time, your stat, your CSS and your JavaScript are actually static files, along with all your images and whatever other things, and it's simply the HTML that's being generated from those things um, that's mm -hmm. being rendered on the server side and shipped. So. Um, that's where I've kind of fallen on that term. I don't know if you all have any input on the intricacies there, but it's like, when is that HTML document rendered is basically the end, the, is my line. Mm. Yeah, or, or even parts of the document, right? Because as we'll right. get into with some of these hybrid approaches, it's like maybe you have you used the, the app shell model in air quotes, or you have like part of your page, you know, pre-rendered and the other part is, uh, you know, clients that rendered and so on, things that we'll get into, but... Yeah, I wrote here just in our show notes to prep ahead of time that the rendering phase is actually um, a phase that browsers perform. So as Alex said, like they'll download the HTML document and turn that into the DOM, the document object model. Likewise, they'll get the CSS and turn that into the CSS object model. And using those two, then they perform this, the next, one of the next phases, which is the rendering phase where they actually turn that into, you know, what is ultimately going to be 
painted to the to the browser user user's gonna see that. But yeah, that that um the lines get blurry when you talk about generating HTML on the server, as as Alex said. So so yeah, we'll use so going forward in this episode, I think we'll use the term render render uh in kind of the col- colloquial meaning, just to mean like you're taking you know, you're taking some data and doing templating and to result in, you know, or to achieve the uh the, the document or even a part of um that H that HTML that makes up the document. Uh so that's ready to be, you know, served uh, to the user. So uh, yeah, with that, let's get into like a few types of rendering that exist then. So let's go all the way back to like the early days of the web when it was it was an easier, a simpler time. Um, when really, you know, when the web started, it was a collection of static HTML files is what made up uh, a website. And really it was just, you know, visiting, um, visiting a URL that corresponded to one of those HTML files and everything was hard coded in it. So all the HTML tags and then the content in between them was already there, you know, no database queries necessary, no caching necessary. I, I suppose you could still cache those these static files these days on a CDN or whatever, but, but yeah, in its simplest form is just like already uh, authored HTML files um, sitting on a server. Um, but there's some shortcomings to that, like Alex or Will, like how did we move from that to needing to talk to a database and, you know, inject data on the fly what benefits did we get there? Yeah, I mean, you inevitably on a website, you're you as you want to make it more feature rich and things. There, there are two things that can happen. You want more interactivity on the front end, uh, or you want to perform operations based on uh, identifying who is visiting your site, or uh, based on something that's happening at a period in, in time so whether whether that's like you want to have a dynamic site that can get updated news or or something like that and rather than uh manually editing html <laughs> and then pushing it back over ftp or something like that you you want to uh make it more dynamic in a way where it can live on forever and not have to be edited by some HTML editor. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I thought that was the webmaster's job. What am <laughs> I paying? What am I paying this guy for? <laughs> He's not going to manually make my edits. Yeah. So this, I, mean, I mean, we probably all know this, but just imagine maintaining a blog where like the HTML pay for every blog post doesn't change. Maybe like an ID header, like it's post mm-hmm. two instead of post 10, right. but like your HTML doesn't change. It's just the content that's changing. So hence we invented templating. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> we can inject that content into the same template over and over. Right. Yeah. I can remember first learning web development, like putting together an HTML page that was meant to live at one route then creating another page and then looking at the two going, oh wait, but the header and then the footer. Mm-hmm. I'm just, yeah. there's a lot there's I'm going to duplicate these across every single page. Yep. I need more dynamism here. I need an actual programming language, right? So right. so yeah, that that gave rise to um uh PHP and ASPX and these uh other technologies. Um and it became especially powerful when we paired that with a database, right? So if somebody uh went to a certain route um of your website, you could query the database to say, you know, what data exists for this particular uh page. And then do the templating, templating, and deliver that to the user. Uh, and that also gave rise to con- uh, content management systems. So WordPress, you know, Drupal, Joomla. I think a lot of those came out of of these days. And that took it one step further. Rather than just being able to pull data out of a database and display it to the user, now you can even have content creators, even though they they may not know how to like edit HTML themselves. Uh, they're they're able to input content into the database um, and. Uh, knowing that at the end of the day, it will be you know, pulled out and displayed to the user. So all of that uh, that we've just described is called server-side rendering. Um, so that's, you know, as the name suggests, uh, on the server, when the request is received uh, by the server, data is pulled out of the database and templating happens. And then uh, a complete HTML document is then delivered to, to the, the user, to the browser, and that's um, what's displayed. From there, things got... Uh, a, a bit more complex though, um, with client side rendering. So one of my, you know, the, one of the first examples that always comes to mind for me is Google maps, right? I remember when, 
you know, when the web was, was younger and like the first time I saw Google maps and how you could just grab a, an area of the map and pan, pan around and zoom and just more tiles of the map would just on the fly be added and thinking, whoa, this is cool. I didn't have to refresh the page. Right. So what are a few other, uh, do you, do you all have another a good example of like client side rendering content like that? Uh, that's a good, I can't think of any like great examples of like, this was the first site to ever be rendered client side, but I know yeah. that, uh, there was a period in time where it, it kind of coincided with, um, the release of jQuery, I guess, because there was a period in time where, uh, JavaScript was seen. A lot of people still see this, but it was, it was seen as more like a, uh, a toy language that you can use to do very simple things. And then jQuery came out and really enhanced the ability for you to get, you know, dynamically generate Dom. Um, it made fetching data a lot easier than creating your, a big XHR object and like manipulating all the, uh, different properties you need to all that stuff just like came about. And that's when it was clear that, Hey, we, you know, we have a lot of power at our fingertips, like on our phones and at our lap on our laptops and our desktop computers. Why don't we harness some of that for rendering instead of bogging down the server for all of that? Uh, and, and jQuery really enabled that. And then, you know, from there you had more frameworks and, and tools that were client side focused, uh, for dynamically generating HTML. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I think it's a, just to go back to our definition of rendering, like there's another blur happening right now, right? Of like, people are going, well, like I write HTML in my React. So isn't that when it was rendered? Like you're just, aren't, what does, isn't when React's doing its thing, isn't that pushing that into the DOM and thus you're rendering as you defined it, that's not the right, like there's another blur of lines here. Um, mm -hmm. But like we need to be reminded like jsx is not html like mm -hmm. and that even that form of jsx like that's only happening in your editor that's not what's getting shipped to the browser so like that yeah that's why this client side running is really an important topic like when we're talking about uh, when we'll get the stuff later is like that rendering is truly happening in the client right our definition of when does it become html still applies because your react code or your view code is becoming HTML in your browser. Yeah, I mean, especially with React, you see those components and and JSX is a higher level syntax that has, yeah. you know, loosely translates to HTML, but uh, what actually happens behind the scenes is it translates into a bunch of JavaScript that yep. uh, dynamically puts HTML on the uh, in the browser, in the DOM. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so client side rendering uh, unlocked a, a bit more like interactivity, you know, and being able to fetch data on the fly without a full page reload, uh, which was powerful. So in my Google Maps example, that would be one. Another would be if there's like a load more button, you know, yep. if the user yep. has a list of 10 items and then they hit load more. Infinite um, scroll. Yeah. Infinite scroll, exactly. Yeah. Other I think examples. the really nice thing about that, that client side rendering enabled was you could... I mean, you had that initial load, which was kind of annoying to deal with, but then every subsequent page view and all that was much faster. You could prefetch data. You could do all these, all these cool tricks to make it so that the experience of visiting a website feels more like, uh, apps on your phone or, or something like that, that kind of don't delay when they're rendering and you don't get like a a blip in the screen every time you click a link and, and things yeah. like that. You can build um, so that was, dash, you know, live data yeah. dashboards that are, you know, using web sockets and stuff. And yep. yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's all client side rendering was, I mean, huge in enabling that. And then I feel like past that point, uh, we have been doing, uh, making things very complicated, but all in an effort to reduce that time to, uh on the first load right and that's the that's where all the server side rendering and and, and all this comes into play is like yeah. reducing that time to first load the page yeah and, and for those listening uh you might be wondering like where does the, the term spa like a single page app come in like 
a single page app is a type of client side rendering that's being done. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll get into more of the various kinds of client side rendering later, probably. But that's true. There are you could have um, prior to single page apps, there was still client side rendering. So there was still like serve up a page and then render it, and then you go to the next page and it'll serve up the page from the back end as well, and you will continue to render it out. And then single page apps took advantage of uh, browser based. Uh, was it called like push state, but like state based routing in the browser yep. to avoid having to reload the page? See, also CSR client side routing, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> as if things weren't confusing enough, yeah, right. So, so yeah, the cl client side rendering that we've been talking about, um, most often that happened with an Ajax request, uh, asynchronous JavaScript and XML, which isn't a term you hear a whole lot anymore because now we're doing so many requests from the client. It's it's so commonplace, but that's what it was called when it was uh, introduced. And then like, as Alex mentioned, once you get into web sockets and things, it gets uh, next level, but um, that would be yeah, re doing your rendering on the client. And there's, there's kind of a, a pendulum that seems to swing back and forth here. Like in the beginning of the web, everything was uh, server side rendered, you know? Uh, and then after uh, client side rendering became popular, uh, I think many folks like swung the other direction. They thought, this is great. Having all, all this logic close to the user gives them a really nice interactive experience. Let's do, do all of that, you know, do all client side rendering and nothing else. Um, and uh, for some apps that works great and that does the trick. Um, but for others, it doesn't like if you need, um, if you need a good SEO is one of the classic examples. So if it's a, a blog or, um, or some publication where you want the fully rendered HTML document on the initial load, then you don't get that uh, with CSR. Uh, now Google, yeah. as I understand yeah. it, Google, Google, you know, they say they they do parse and execute JavaScript when they crawl it, but I don't know. It's always it's always a question for um for like how 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 long the execution time lasts before they consider the page to be done. And other web you know web uh, crawlers, I don't believe, have that same capability yeah. or at least to, to that extent so it's still as as we um as it stands today it's still best practice to have a you know fully rendered document for that. yeah google has yeah. uh has had that message for years i think i mean i think i first yeah. first saw the message around like the 2012 time frame where they said yeah we can crawl the javascript apps and understand where they're rendered and and that was just absolutely not true at that point in time uh and the and it's you know it probably gets better all the time, but nevertheless, yeah. Why there was never a, yeah a standard was never created to inform crawlers that you're done rendering or or something mm -hmm. like that. So, uh, so without that, the browser is still you know making its best guess at whether the well no, um, yeah the other side of this is the entire performance question right like the other thing we learned with spas is wow this performance sucks especially if you're on a low power device or have limited bandwidth which um you know we, we like to pretend only happens in third world countries but the reality is like there's rural parts of the us that this is very yep. true like i live in a vehicle traveling and i, I work on a cell phone connection 90 percent of the time and i i'm like oh this all affects me now <laughs> yeah well, and actually, and that's part of, obviously, we're going to get into that, but that's part of the the push to get back into more server-side rendering because yeah, uh, yeah. client-side rendering can vary widely based on devices, yeah. uh, whereas most, you know, as long as you ship the HTML down, most browsers now are fast enough to uh, yeah. to render that quickly, yeah. and, and that's about the best you can do. Yeah. Um, but which having a, to run a lot of JavaScript can make things very slow on very older slow. devices. Which is a great transition to, to static site generation. And I'm sure we'll get into to more uh, modern ones with like Gatsby and, and the, the fancy stuff they do. But, mm. um, you know, just your, um, your classic, like whether they're using Go or um, various templating languages, uh, is Mustache one? Am I remembering? Yeah. It is. Like, yeah. Yeah. like there's all these things that people are like, well, why are my blog, my blog posts aren't changing. Like I don't need to re-render those on every person's mm -hmm. browser. Like let's save some performance and just generate it once. Um, 
right? That's the, and that's, um, that adds a, kind of our third category, right? So we, we talked about the, like the runtime server for SSR. We've talked about the client side and the browser and that adds build time. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. There's this build server that, that does that rendering. Yeah, so they're actually, before uh, kind of this really server-side rendering with single page apps, with, you know, not necessarily like the PHP, uh, ASP old way of server-side rendering, but yeah. the um, there was like that hybrid uh, isomorphic app that you can render on the server and on the client. Uh, that still exists today. That's what most people think of when they think of server-side rendered apps today. Uh, that is, uh, there was like a step in before that existed that was um, snapshot, like taking snapshots of apps. So you have right. like a, a client-side rendered application. You have something, have your own crawler that goes out there, takes a snapshot of the app, and then you send that to uh, browsers or uh, web crawlers or things like that, um, that you don't necessarily care about the visual experience or you want to provide them a faster experience for loading an application. Yeah. But then once it gets down to the front end, like there's no JavaScript running at that point. So you might have a really crappy yeah. experience trying to use that. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's kind of how Stratic works, I believe. I don't want to misspeak. Uh, I'm not terribly familiar with their product, but they use WordPress basically as a static site generator. Yeah. Um, and just, yeah, capture that snapshot of all the routes and then uh, serve those up. Mm -hmm. which is interesting. Yeah, and, and you know, this, that's all about trade-offs, right? So in uh, server-side rendering and client-side rendering, they work great and you will get up-to-date data, like whatever's in the database at the time the request came in, that's yep. what you'll get. So like, it's great for, for that aspect. It'll be fresh data. Um, but you take a performance hit, you know, that's the trade-off yeah. there. So, so yeah, the rise of static site generators, um, Alex mentioned a, a, a few of them, like I think of, uh, Jekyll and Hugo, uh, a few of those, uh, frameworks, those became popular for, um, like blogs, as, as you mentioned, Alex. So if somebody's mm -hmm. blog, who, you know, it doesn't, site. Yeah, it doesn't change over time. Uh, they can just run a build to generate the new static versions of the pages using whatever templating you know language they uh, they prefer. Generate those HTML files and then those just go live. Um, and that works great for many many use cases. But the trade off there, you know, you get a great speed with that. But the trade off is now it's stale data, right? If it is something that changes um, on a on a periodic basis. Now you're still you're still serving up a stale data that uh, version of that. So how do you refresh? You know how do you invalidate those old HTML files and and replace them? Um, and we'll get into that more uh, in a, in a minute here. Uh, next, though, I wanted to talk about a kind of a hybrid approach. So this would be where you um, combine one of the first two approaches. So either not the first two, one of the two server side approaches. So either server side rendering or static site uh, generation generation with client side, uh, rendering. Yep. Um, so you may have heard like the term app shell or the app shell model, uh, being used before. So that refers to like when, um, uh, an HTML document is delivered and has some of the page there. So it might have like the header footer sidebar, some of the things that are like the same for every user, but not all of it. There may be, you know, just an empty div or something, um, on the page. And that's used as like the root element where a, a react or view L, uh, um, app would take over then and figure out is the person logged in do they have access to view this gated content or whatever checks you know need to happen there uh like authentication for instance and then once they verify those things they then you know are able to fetch th that uh, protected or gated data and then render it to the page on the client so that's where you know again uh, the lines get blurred where it's like s much of the page is generated on the server but then we're having this JavaScript framework kind of take it from there and, and yeah. do the rest of it, right? Yeah. So yeah, like, yeah, it's interesting. This basically SPAs fall under this category too, right? Like usually your SPA, I think the difference between the app shell model and an SPA basically is how much of the site is pre-rendered and there's not a perfect mm -hmm. line there. Um, you know, when I first started reading about app shell, it was very much, a, there's a large amount of, the, like you said, headers, footers, maybe menus that exist um, and then, your data is just filled into that. And, you know, I remember reading stuff from Google about that, whereas SPAs, it's, you know, 
you you have nothing. You basically have a div um, that everything's right. being run in, run into uh, rendered into. Yeah, yeah. So, Although for a while it was it was pretty common to uh, to use a combination of one of those template rendering like a handlebars or or uh, you know mustache or or some other template language, and then you render your single page app into a specific div or a specific right. uh, yeah. point in the app. So uh, you, that opens up the concept for whatever you don't need, you can, you know, like whatever does not need to be very dynamic can be rendered uh, ahead of time. So the the single page app concept is kind of like if you do want to go full bore and just only have a div or render directly into the body and have nothing else in the body, that's that is one way to do it. But uh, yeah. I feel like there were plenty of sites even when CSR first came out, there were plenty of sites that uh, were still rendering a heavy amount of the page without yeah. the, uh, the framework yeah, on the front Yeah, I would end. say that was almost the, the original. And the, the SPA yeah. just took that to an extreme. Um, yeah, we, exactly. I think we all regretted. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So my question to you all is, uh, why would somebody take the trouble to combine several of these approaches, right? Because thinking about them in isolation, yeah. Is probably easier. So why would I, you know, combine server-side rendering or or static site generation to generate a large portion of my page, but then have, you know, more um, more of it generated on the client? Why not just do all client-side rendering well, at that point? Like, what do I gain? I think uh, maybe this is not a popular opinion, but my opinion is people wouldn't do that unless it was easy, right? Like. It people didn't do that for a long time. I mean, there were there's always been people who have been optimizing things to the nth degree. So if you're the if you're in a type of business or you're the type of developer uh, who re it really wants to do that, people have always optimized things, right? But I'd say the majority of people they would have loved to have done many of the things we can do today, mm -hmm. five years ago, and it was totally possible. But the amount the battle you had to fight to get there was so great that people just they were just like yeah i'm not going to worry about that and now it's becoming easier and easier so now yeah. you want to combine a lot of these things because it leads to a faster load time uh leads to your your site being more accessible in uh you mm -hmm. know countries with slower networks or, or areas of the world with slower networks or uh you know areas where people have very uh, you know, rudimentary devices, um, mm. you know, like the same way people are running doom on like a, <laughs> a cell phone and, and stuff like that. Like yeah. all, all this stuff is, um, is becoming more accessible now because of all these new technologies. So now it's like you, everyone wants to take advantage of these and now it's becoming more seamless to do it without having to, um, you know, write a bunch of code for each specific way to do things. So like write a bunch of code for client side rendering, also for static site generation and server side rendering, all of that's kind of merged into one. And it feels much like the experience of writing a single page app. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Two points. I totally agree with everything you said there. Well, so I think there's a business driver happening too, right? Which is literally Google's core, core web vitals becoming an yeah. effect in search, right? So we've seen that huge here at WP Engine and why people want to start going headless is because choosing any one of these, you know, quote unquote basic methods is not necessarily enough. And being able to say this data needs SSR, you know, or maybe I've ever said these routes need SSR. These these routes need are fine being completely, you know, statically generated, mm -hmm. and optimizing uh, caching and data um, on a per route, and as we'll talk about soon, even a per component basis, um, means that they can they can drive those performance metrics better and better, and and get right. better results. Um, and that leads into like what I'm super excited and why I think we're going JavaScript, whether we, you know, certain people like it or not. I think we're all <laughs> JavaScript devs around here, so we like it. But um, is, D is DHH one of those people? 
I, I don't even know. I don't care at this point. <laughs> <laughs> like there is something you get from developing in JavaScript that you cannot and will not for the most part, probably <laughs> ever get from any other language. And that is I can write a single React or you know JavaScript component, whatever my language is, and it can be rendered server side, it can be rendered at build time, and it can be rendered on client side. And it does not matter. We can thank Node for this. <laughs> thank you, Node. Um, you know, and we right. we can thank JavaScript frameworks for this. You know, if if I'm using Hugo and Go templating, like yeah, that's their build times are insanely fast, and I don't want to dismiss any of the work people have done in these other departments. But at the end of the day, like I have to write my Hugo components. And then if I want to do something client side, I have to write React or whatever my JavaScript is. You know, if I want to go build something with WordPress, like cool, I've got to write PHP components and I've got to write JavaScript components. And there's not a lot of overlap there. The fact that I can come and show up and write one component and one server and it works everywhere is amazing. You know, we, we talk about the portability of React, and at least in the early days, that meant, you know, React Native, like, um, yeah. you know, oh, look, you can write one component, use it multiple places. And it's like, that's actually a really bad experience from what I've heard. <laughs> like, so, yeah, ahead, there, there's one thing that people might be thinking right now, like, ooh, what about WebAssembly, right? Which is like, there's always right. the promise of WebAssembly in the future. It's been, it's been you know, five years out for the past five years. And the, uh, the fact of the matter is, even with WebAssembly, you can only do so much at the end of the day. WebAssembly doesn't, as far as I'm, I know, does not allow direct in, uh, interaction with the DOM. So yeah. you still need an interop layer with JavaScript. So right. the... Yep. Your, your point about JavaScript being able to be used in all these different environments still yeah. stands uh, yeah. and, and, my, and would even stand in a world of WebAssembly. Yeah, and my one caveat was I was thinking in the back of my head WebAssembly, uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Like, I, 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 we'll see where it goes, but... <laughs> yeah, Will, I've, I've listened to one, like, uh, Google developers podcast a while back, and they were, they were touching on that, the idea... I think some work is in progress to have WebAssembly, um, have WebAssembly code, you know, be able to make manual do DOM manipulations, for instance, without going through JavaScript, which would be really interesting. But, but yeah, for now, I don't think that's a thing. And and really, quite honestly, it's probably not worth the effort at this point. I, I've even yeah. seen some people, you know, just geeking out about the performance. You know, they think, oh, well, I'll just write everything in in Rust, you know, and it'll uh, in in WebAssembly, and it'll, it'll be lightning quick. But then when they run actual speed tests, it, it turns out web browsers, their JavaScript engines are very efficient at this point at optimizing yeah. that code and running it lightning quick. So it's, you know, unless you're doing something very computationally in uh, intensive and, and it's something that, that, you know, a language like Rust really, really excels at, I think it's kind of diminishing returns for all that, all the extra work. I'm pretty sure I saw recently someone got Node.js running inside WebAssembly. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I don't know uh, why. <laughs> well, maybe we because can, I could. We can take a cool, a cool little uh, detour here. So, Stackbit. I'm trying to remember the name of the startup, but there's one company uh, who is doing that. They've, um, they're, they've created this technology called Web Containers. So think of a Docker container where you have an isolated environment. You know, they've created Web Containers. So they use like this, this. Uh, they use Wasm, and they've re-implemented Node. It runs inside of a container in your browser and they've polyfilled some things like when, when node tries to write to the file system, but there isn't one thing when it tries to do things like that, they've polyfilled all of those things. So it's, it's able to do all the things that node really, really can other places, which is really interesting. One of the first things that they're trying to do is have an in browser, um, development environment from what I understand. So, so it's basically like, instead of running running uh, as we all do you know you go on the command line and type N npm run dev or whatever you start the environment somewhere else right and you go over to your browser and actually visit the site their first product as i understand it would be it would unify those two so it'd be like you start the container in the browser and then visit the route in the browser and yeah. you, know, you can do your development and get hot reloading and all this kind of stuff It'd be really interesting technology applied to like 
yeah, that'd be super interesting if that got applied to VS Code, like in browsers. So like, mm -hmm. if you don't know about yeah. github.dev yet, um, just go to your favorite repo and re replace the .com with .dev and your mind will be blown. Um, yeah, it's super cool. But uh, it's VS Code in the browser for your repo. and But right now, yeah, you can't really run a lot of stuff in there. So if you could actually just like, oh, here's my repo, like npm run dev, and uh, all of a sudden, you're you're running your repo and all in browser that would be really cool yeah yeah so it's a cool idea what you know whether it'll catch on and have a lot of practicality i'm not sure but it's a cool idea anyway and i think they're they're starting with like a local development environment as being the first use case but i've heard the founder i watched a few of his talks and he says like oh yeah and we can we've been imagining a few others that having local containers like that would uh, you know be beneficial wow. for so yeah cool thing to to follow along with anyway um so we've, we've been through several types of rendering, uh, including kind of hybrid approaches where you're pre-rendering some of the page, but doing uh, um, some of the you know, markup injected on the client. Let's blur those lines even more and talk about doing it on a per component basis. Um, so, so Alex, this is on your, your list. So let's yeah. you can speak to this real quick. So React has announced um, what it calls server components. So what's the yeah. value so prop there? I'll I'll, st I'll step back a little bit and kind of do a run up to this. So, yeah. you know, we we've talked about these kind of four like static SSR, SSG, and CSR. Like those are your like four base units for for com compiling rendering the web um, to HTML. And we've gotten into all these hybrid components. And uh, but for the most part, our actual frameworks we're using like Gatsby, Next, Noxt, uh, Svelte kit, new one. Uh, they back in the day, they only ever did one thing, right? Hugo did SSG, PHP did SSR, and there was no like you had to choose at an app level how you were going to render your application. The, with the hybrid models, you could start doing a little bit of CSR with um, either SSR or SSG, and that's super beneficial. Um, one thing like SvelteKit's doing really well is uh, you can, on a per like template basis, say this is SSG, this is SSR, and mm -hmm. um, it gives you really fine grained control, which is great because you write everything basically the same, and it's literally a boolean that tells the build step like how how to treat this and what code to wrap around it, um, and now that obviously like. Gatsby can't do that at this moment, right? Because there is no runtime server to do SSR. Um, it all has to happen at build, uh, which if you're not going to uh, Gatsby camp, which at the time of recording is in our future, at the time of listening will probably be in the past, go check it out. They're about to announce some really, really cool things. Um, go check that out. But uh, so like, we're seeing more like Next is getting better at this with their um, get server side props and get static props. And you're able to find like what routes are how and where they're being rendered. And the next logical extension of that is well, there's very different things. Like I might have a blog post and all the blog content can be statically generated at build time. Like that's not changing so often uh, that I need to worry about that but I want people to be able to, be able to log into my app and comment. So that mm -hmm. data specifically needs to be clutched client side. And now with things like Gatsby, like because you're rebooting and doing that full hydration and Next is the same way, you get all that client side tooling, but you have to ship all that React code that templates all of the static data that's getting hydrated, you know, Use, being used to hydrate and build that HTML on the app side and the client side. So what server components do is they basically at the component level, you can say this component always gets rendered on the client. It always gets rendered on the server or depending on its parent, it can do one or the other. And so I can now take everything. I can write a bunch of React code that never gets shipped to my user's browser. And that's saving bits of data across the wire that's saving flops on your processor and their devices. That's a huge win. And 
ultimately what all this, these like improvements have slowly been doing is handing performance decisions back to the developers, right? They don't have to choose at the app level and then go, oh, Gatsby was the wrong choice for my use case. I guess I need to go switch my entire app to Next or whatever you're, you know, mm -hmm. like you can just be like, oh, let me just flip this switch. And that's mm -hmm. really cool. So you view it as like, as a, as like zooming in even further, right? Yeah, we're getting slowly getting more and more granular control of yeah. what pages, what routes, um, and now what components um, are using what rendering pattern. And that's, yeah, yeah, that's really cool. That is cool. Yeah, on the uh, React blog, they introduced it with this uh, headline. It says, introducing zero bundle size React server components, which is attention grabbing. It's cool to me because you can, um, my, my understanding of how it works is like, if you had some, some component that needs to, uh, take in a date as, as props and then run that through, use some date library, like moment JS or date FNS or something to format it, let's say, and then, you know, in, uh, inject that into the markup, that date library, if that's the only thing it does, it's never needed on the client. But as it stands right now, if you, if you're running a react app, it's like, you would have to ship that whole library to the to the um, the client so that when rendering happens, it would have that library available to be yep. able to pass the date to it and render that and so on. So if you're using server components and you have you know, you know designated that that component is a server component only, um, my understanding is it would you know generate that uh, the resulting markup from running it through um, you know that that uh, date library to to um, generate the date and then you know format the HTML. It would take the resulting HTML and just stream that down to the client. So React would know, you know, in this spot right here in the component tree, instead of having a, a live in air quotes component that's you know going to take new props and re-render itself or do data fetching on the client, we're doing none of that. Instead, we've done that ahead of time. This is the chunk of HTML that we're, you know, we've, we're streaming down and inserting in this spot, which you know trims the bundle size and and is a cool yeah. thing. It's really cool. Um... Yeah, a, a really great example of this where I'm excited about this on WordPress in WordPress world, right? Is mm -hmm. uh, if, especially if you're using uh, Gutenberg components, which uh, uh, you can tout that upcoming podcast later, Callan. But yeah. uh, when if you're working with you know Gutenberg, you there's not a lot of good options on how to convert those Gutenberg components into actual React components you've built. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the methods right now is you have to which it ends up shipping to the browser, you have to get an HTML parser that like parses all that HTML and then goes in and goes, oh, if, you know, if these certain things are true, convert it to this component. And that's a lot, I've done that, but yep. it's a lot of, you know, I think the WP GraphQL site is doing that right now. Like sure it works, but that's a lot of extra code that it's doing the identical thing for every client that it could be done once at build time. Um, and True. server components will just, you wrap that whole thing in server components and you have, you know, input of the data from your, your API and yet outputs um, static HTML effectively that just gets inserted. So it'd be really cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I, I don't believe that's in um, the current version of React, but it's it, it pre-release right. at, at this point, so. So yeah, for, for folks listening, um, just stay tuned. If you Google that and you can't find uh, projects with it, yeah, that's why it might not be uh, out just yet, but there is a, you know, a proof of concept exists and the core team's working on it, which is exciting. Uh, next, I'd like to talk about uh, one feature that Next.js has, um, and that's incremental static regeneration. So this is, a, again, it's kind of a, a combination of a few of the other approaches, or it takes server-side rendering but apply some caching to kind of achieve or arrive at something that is uh, a static page. Um, so Alex, like what's your take on ISR? How would you describe that to somebody? Yeah, yeah, I think you described it pretty well. So it's it's kind of build as a, as, as a static um, or, or like, you know, like you have a static asset basically kind of like what Gatsby does, right? If like you're, you have something pre-rendered, that's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. And so you're not doing, you know, you're not re-rendering your blog post or whatever page on every request. Um, and so the benefit here is basically they are doing SSR in that they, mm -hmm. the rendering of that HTML is happening on your production server. 
it's not happening at build time. Mm -hmm. But they're putting a stale while revalidate cache in front of that. So request comes in, oh, there's nothing cached. The SSR happens and that gets served back to the user, but it gets cached in that layer for whatever um, you know, timeout you've set. And then everyone else just gets that pre-rendered content right away and the SSR mm -hmm. doesn't have to happen. And this is exactly how modern CDNs work, right? Uh, the difference is, right, if I left, if I just added stale while revalidate headers to an SSR page, every point of presence on my CDN that needs that doesn't have that cached would be making this request back to the server. By adding this still our validate cached at the server level, you reduce that. So if I, you know Cloudflare has something like 200 pops, if all 200 of those pops made a request and this cache wasn't on the server, that would be 200 times I would have to generate this. Now I just mm -hmm. regenerate it on the first one and all 199 other pops just get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is very cool. And and uh, due to the way stale while revalidate works, that means there's no uh, wait time. Like when the page um, is, is expired, is being invalidated, you might think to yourself like, oh, well, that means that one unlucky user who's the one who hits the hits the page when it's expired, they're going to get a slow page reload while it's rebuilt. Um, but that's not what happens. Instead, what next will do is it'll uh, serve up the stale you know version of that page, like maybe one last time to that person, and then it just kicks off a revalidation process uh, on on its server. So it will regenerate the page in the background, and when it's ready, it will swap the old with the new. So you get a yeah. uh, great performance gain there. Yep. I mean, and, and in a heavily trafficked site, it would it could happen to more than one person, right? It would happen to sure one person goes yeah. and triggers the revalidation, but multiple people could come in during that time and get the stale data. Right. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So that's a that's another uh, cool approach. Um, that one though is time based. So if you uh, opt into using ISR, uh, you have to provide some kind of threshold. So you tell Next.js how often you want it to invalidate that page and then build a new version of it. Uh, and those rebuilds aren't free. Um, as we heard on a previous episode that we did with uh, Greg Rickaby of Web Dev Studios, um, they built a built and launched a headless WordPress site for a client of theirs using Next.js. And they you know, opted into using ISR and that amount was set, um, can't recall what I said, it was set kind of low, like every one minute or two minutes or something which for small sites might be no problem. Um, but for this particular client, the number of pages was like in the thousands. You know? So for them, that meant every one minute or, or however long you know, that, that threshold is, the uh, WordPress server was then getting bombarded with another thousand requests to re regenerate the pages. So they had to do some fine tuning there to figure out you know, how, um, how, how far can we you know, tweak, tweak that number to where you know, uh, the stale data is served up longer but it gets refreshed often enough, you know, to satisfy the needs of the site there. So, so something to keep in mind if you uh, opt into ISR, uh, it is time time based. Uh, another approach that we've heard about recently on the podcast is Netlify's distributed persistent rendering or DPR. I hadn't heard of this until we had the Netlify um, developer experience team on, and uh, I think it was uh, Cassidy who spoke to uh, DPR. And it seems like a cool solution. Um, I I view it as very similar to uh, to Next ISR feature, only it's not time based. My understanding is that it, instead it's based on builds because uh, Netlify, you know, kind of their whole ethos is atomic builds. And the idea here, as I understand it, is um, you would have uh, a build would occur, and then the very first time a, a user hits a site, a static version of that page would be um, created, and that static page would be served up forevermore uh, as long as that build is still the one, you know, the one canonical build being used. Uh, but as soon as another build is triggered and it, you know, that old build gets replaced yeah. at that time, the process would repeat and that, you know, those pages would be refreshed, uh, which is kind of a cool approach rather than doing it, you know, kind of time-based like next does it, does it based on individual uh, builds. Yeah, which is great because, right, like there's two aspects, like builds a good way to do it because, right, you can trigger that with like a web hook from your CMS. So when you hit save mm -hmm. in your CMS, it triggers a build and your content changes. But I think the, the really cool thing about this 
if they've abstracted this out of the framework, it's no longer framework dependent. So right, right. this now we get this kind of feature, we get an ISR, but we get it at the platform level and not at the framework level. So once again, like we can choose a, a framework that works best for us on other metrics while still benefiting from this really cool method of doing cache and validation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, and let's talk about one more uh, thing in the same you know line of thinking here, and that is so Next.js is incremental stack regeneration it is time based. Netlify is distributed persistent rendering it is build based. Um, but there's even another that I can think of um, that Gatsby brings to the table with its incremental builds feature, uh, and that is one that is data changes based, right? Because Gatsby, and I'll let you speak to this, Alex, because you have a long history there, but. It uh, rather than being based on time or based on when the last build happens, instead it can you know because Gatsby ships with this unified GraphQL data layer, it actually knows which data changed and what what pages are affected as a result, so it's able to rebuild only those um, pages. I got that about right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's I mean uh, the Gatsby you know community has gone through some up and downs and. Uh, and people, you know, like they, everyone loves to complain about tools. Um, but uh, like, I, I think that's the one thing that's been consistently my favorite thing in the Gatsby user ecosystem is that data layer because mm -hmm. of um, what it provides and the easy plug and play you get to access data from whatever APIs, whether that's, you know, Drupal or WordPress or Shopify. Um, they're doing some really cool things there. And uh, there's, that yeah like you said that key functionality of being to, able to associate a single piece of data to where it's used in the entirety of the app right so when we start talking about caching right wordpress sites and a lot of php based sites um and it's probably true on sites outside of php like you do you you hit save like you update a post your entire cache most like hosting platforms including wp engine will blow the cdn cache for that entire site so let's say you mm -hmm. you edit the title of a post well okay it's at least the post page has that um yeah. there, there's an archive you know of all posts somewhere that have that title in it that now needs to be purged um you might have a widget somewhere you know top three posts on your home page right, that has sure. that title but do we know if this post specifically is in that? Yeah. And, oh, is there a menu somewhere that includes the title of this post? And how many pages is that menu on? Like, you, the more you think about it, the more you're like, yeah, there's no way to actually know. So the safest thing to do is just purge the entire cache. Right. But then we're back to our performance problems, <laughs> right? Like, oh, now, now that's a all these new requests to the page, including pages that didn't actually need their cache blown, but we didn't know that, are having to are putting load back on our server and off of our CDN. Um, right. So that that ability to know what data is being used where on what routes is really really huge, and Gatsby so far has used that to let, to build their their cloud products and that incremental static or not um, blanking on the name of it. <laughs> um, your uh, incremental builds. DPR. Incremental builds. Thank you. Oh, yes. um, incremental builds. Yeah, and uh, like I said earlier, uh, go check out the uh, Gatsby Camp stuff that's happening here later in September uh, because they're about to announce some really cool stuff and start leveraging that platform in some really cool ways. Um, and I think most so, of that will be open sourced and not cloud products. Yeah, so that stuff sounds really, I mean, it sounds incredibly interesting and I'm excited to, to hear uh, about what they have in store. Circling back to the distributed persistent rendering, I don't, yeah. I don't think, I think Gatsby is actually taking it one step further because, and maybe this is, first of all, DPR is not a, uh, you know, it's still in development, right? It's, it's not like a, a done deal. So plans can change. Um, but my understanding with DPR is that it's actually like, it's similar to the stale while revalidate, yep. but it's like, you lose the stale part. So instead of a user going to the site and getting stale data, 
they might actually go to the site and have to wait for the data because you've triggered, you know, a, a rebuild. And so you're rebuilding. Um, what it enables is you can you can develop like what that rebuild means, whether it's rebuilding the entire site or rebuilding that page or, or, or what you want to do. So you can take advantage of, you know, if you have a site with thousands of pages, uh, maybe like 90% of those pages can be generated very quickly. And then 10% might take a longer time to be statically generated. So you can, you can play with how you generate your site and what needs to be generated and all of that. But uh, as far as I know, DPR doesn't take a, uh, doesn't form an opinion around how you generate your site, but it does form an opinion on how your site is served to the client. So the client, you still with DPR, you might get a um, a slower first load for a subset of users who who hit your site at the time where you are rebuilding or you need a rebuild or something like that. Uh, so there's still a trade-off between ISR. So I think that what it sounds like with the way that Gatsby is going or 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 kind of the way that Gatsby's platform is built, uh, they have an opportunity to take it a step further where it's more difficult to take it a step further in a more in a like a generic way. It requires more uh, of a a full platform to take advantage of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and just the just the knowledge of where is this data used, right? Because yep. so so much of the web up to this point was just like data lives over here, and the templates can change at any time. The developer might have added, as you know, Alex said, like maybe there's the featured post section that's now it's on the home page, now it's whatever. There's kind of a disconnect there. So, yeah, Gatsby, um, it's really interesting the idea of like having this one pipeline of data and just the knowledge of where that's used, so they know what to what cache to bust. Is cool. I'll be watching that with interest. Um, next, we want to get into uh, where does rendering take place? Um, so Alex, as part of our prep for the show, he had this uh, interesting observation that he had done um, just kind of comparing like where does rendering take place with when it takes place. And just thinking about yeah. it through those two different lenses, um, it allows you to kind of think about it uh, in different ways. So so like, uh, let's answer the question, where does rendering take place? Um, Alex, like what are the primary places? Yeah, so I mean, we've kind of alluded to this, I think, in our static versus SSR versus SSG versus CSR, right? Like the rendering of that HTML can happen effectively uh, in the HTML file itself, right? Author writes code, it's, it's the resultant HTML. There's nothing that's ever going to change. So it's quote unquote been rendered, yeah. um, right? There's a build server so um, that can generate HTML, um, whether that's a whole page or an aspect of a page. There's the runtime server, which we lost with uh, OG Jamstack and, you know, mm -hmm. original Netlify, like, was like, wait, do we actually need this? You know, we can just use these functions and that's, that's gotten us right. a long ways. Right. Um, but we lost that runtime server. So like, that's one of the things that's unique about WP Engine's Atlas platform uh, is that we made the conscious choice of like, no, there's still actually a lot of benefit to having that server. And even if you're serving static files for a lot of things, we're still gonna have that server there to, to enable some other cool things. Um, and then finally, there's the client, right? Um, well, that's when your React or whatever your JavaScript framework is actually getting dumped into the HTML and the DOM. Yep. Yeah. So, so that was a, a lot at once. So HTML files, build server, runtime server, and then the client. Um, yeah. And, the and really, so something to, to circle back on here is that uh, earlier, Kellen, you asked like, why would people want to be taking advantage of all these things? And, and the answer is, uh, I mean, they would love to, if those things were simple. And what we've described is is like a very complicated process that is uh, being simplified greatly by tools like Next or like Gatsby or yeah. uh, um, or the Atlas platform. Yeah. And so now it's like you can take advantage of all these without having to really worry about what's going on behind the scenes. You're just writing your application uh, like yeah. you always have been. Yeah, meta frameworks, are, you know, no one... I've 
you know, I have the word architect in my name and I've been working as a front end dev for years. And I, I fully need to admit, I've almost never written a webpack and fig. <laughs> I've never had you, and I can thank I you know have. Meta Frameworks. Uh, I'm sure you have. Well, um, <laughs> you know, thanks to Meta Frameworks, I, I don't really need to for the most part. You know, I might have to add a, a um, you know a, a plugin here or there, but I I don't have to figure out how to do React hydration at that level. Um, yeah. So yeah, all that's becoming easier. Yeah, I uh, I've taken I have an application that I work in work on in my spare time, and uh, I've taken it from I think it was Webpack one, Webpack one or two, all the way to five, and it has been a hell of a journey to try to to take it that far. I mean, there have been so many changes, and and so many times where you're like, well, do I just want to rebuild? I I find that the the easiest way for me to do it has been to completely redo the webpack config every time they have a major update, exactly. even though they do, uh, you know, provide you a way to, to get to the new, uh, framework the, or the new, um, tool. And the reason my reasoning for that is otherwise it feels like my config gets more verbose and I, I am constantly faced with like, well, do I need this anymore? Like, do I need some dependency anymore? Or is that taken care of? And, and yep. so even though you might be on Webpack 5, you feel like you're you're still carrying code from Webpack 2 that you no longer need. And and yeah, that uh, I'm glad when I get to use a framework or something and I don't see some huge build uh, configuration because that is just not what I want to be dealing with when I'm writing an app. <laughs> yeah. You're muted, Kellen. Yeah. Thank you. So we've talked about the where does running take place, uh, kind of the four places. Uh, so it's interesting to think about things that, uh, through that lens. Um, what about when does rendering take place? Yeah, so this was something I never really thought of up until in the last couple of months as I was starting to have conversations with people. Um, I was actually arguing with someone over on the Gatsby team about the definition of SSR. And I was being very pedantic, I'll admit that. Um, but I realized we were having two different conversation because I was focusing on the where aspects of rendering and he was focusing on the when aspects of rendering. And mm -hmm. historically, again, those have been very closely tied. So we haven't had to think about this, but as the more we do these kind of cool, unique things, we do need to start thinking about this. So uh, when we were talking about static HTML files, like, right, as you write that, um, that still to this day is always gonna be equivalent with author time. What, I, I don't know if I invented that or not, but sure. author time, right? Like th those are inextricably linked because of the nature of them. But when we start getting to the SSG, right, we, we start talking about build time. And, um, you know, that affects like Next, right? So Next, even if you create a completely SSR app in Next, you still have build step that's defining, you know, your JavaScript files and all these other things. Um, but your actual HTML gets rendered at, um, or a majority of it, everything except that like minimal SPA or app shell, um, potentially, if it is client side, doing client side stuff. Um, but yeah, like there's that build step in there. So there's that build server. Um, the build server is the where, but it's also can be a when. Uh, then there's the runtime on the server, right? But yep. is why, like what's triggering? There is that server runtime, that is the where, but what's mm. the when of it? Traditionally, SSR has been inextricably linked to the request, an mm -hmm. HTML request coming in. And that's not necessarily required, right? Uh, ISR is a perfect example of this. It's still kind of linked to a request, mm -hmm. but what if, you create had a webhook, you know, I like, I, I've seen GitHub issues on people requesting this of like, is having next enable, like I can create an API interface, like create a webhook that um, I define regenerates based on like the body that comes in from that webhook regenerates certain pages. So then I could, I could tie my ISR no longer to time, but I could right. tie it to a webhook that comes from, let's say WordPress, 
having a data change. I update a post, it says, oh, this post has changed. Uh, do these couple things. And like we talked about how complicated that invalidation can be, but I could say, look, re redo the archive and redo the post page and leave everything else time based. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, it solves a portion of that problem. Um, and then finally, like, when does stuff happen on the client, right? So this is this is classic CSR, like you, you pan across Google Maps and that's when the render happens or, or yeah. an event comes in, right? From, you know, uh, something and that re-renders something because the data is updated, um, you know, whether that's a GraphQL subscription or whatever it is, something happens. It's not necessarily happening when you load the page. Mm -hmm. um, and all of that we can, again, think about in the terms of optimization of like, what what's unique to my app and how is my data, does my data change multiple times a second or does it change once a year or once a lifetime? Um, mm -hmm. And use these, when we start thinking of these and breaking the where and the when of this apart, maybe it's a mostly um, um, theoretical th thought process, but I think there's some real things we can start thinking about and applying to how we're doing certain things and frameworks and, and bring these features into meta frameworks uh, that so the normal people don't have to have these theoretical conversations with themselves. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, and I think uh, it helps to um, keep the terminology straight as well. Like once you start working in, in this uh, decoupled you know, Jamstack uh, kind of kind of kind of architecture, and if you if you say something like, "Oh, well, that that um, that data gets templated on the server," you know, or that data comes from the server, yeah. you know, there's a question mark there. What it's like? Well, which do you mean, like the headless WordPress or the um, Shopify API, like their server, yeah. or the next JS? Yeah. You know, which server? server you know. Know. Which one? Now we're dealing with dealing with two. So, so yeah, saying saying it's you know the the runtime server. Um, versus, you know, one of the like uh, servers behind one of your APIs you're interfacing with can help distinguish those or saying runtime on the client would mean, oh, it's still, you know, at the time a request is made, but from the browser, not on Next.js server. So yeah, that's helpful. Um, I want to talk real briefly about uh, templating. So we've touched on this um, kind of the whole episode. We've, we've uh, danced around this. And we've just uh, talked mainly about like when data is sent from place, place to place. Um, but we haven't talked about where templating happens. So by that, I mean, you, just, you have some data and you have uh, kind of the, uh, the skeleton or the template for markup and you need to inject the data into that, that markup. Uh, and that can happen two different places. Um, so one option would be uh, you can have the browser send HTML down. And I think this is, this is more of the old school approach. This would be, um, you know, like the load more button I talked about, if you had, you know, the first 10 posts, you hit a load more button, the browser could just send send down the actual HTML for the next 10. And you can, you know, append that in, in the DOM to the, the, you know, first list of 10 to arrive at the full list being there. Um, but a more modern approach uh, is typically anytime data like transfers happen between server to server or server to client, um, it's in just kind of some kind of structured data. So usually these days it's JSON data. In the past, it might have been XML and so on. If, if you go that route, it's it's, it's uh, very clean, right? Because then there's no assumptions made about what you're doing with that data. So it can be rendered however the consumer you know wants to uh, to render it, which is good. That's, that's a good thing. Um, but with that, you have to have a client that knows how to render it. Uh, and that may sound, sound silly if you're, you know, uh, doing web development these days, but I can remember doing traditional monolithic sites where I, I wanted to do that. You know, I wanted to send, you know, pure JSON data down and then render that in the client, but all my templating was done using WordPress's theme API and using PHP templates on the server. So it's like, well, how do I, do I have to re reinvent the wheel then? I have to have my template on the server, you know, you know, but also on the client, or should I just say, screw it and just send down the actual HTML to render to the page. And there were workarounds there. Um, one of them is WordPress actually has this um, has this like underscores based utility uh, that you can you can uh, include and use it to do some light templating on the client side. So you can actually do do things like um, even in traditional WordPress, do some form of client side rendering where you're getting data on the fly. 
and then templating it out using this kind of quasi underscores uh, syntax. Um, but it was painful. It's kind of cumbersome to do that. So these days it's become a lot easier as we've talked about with uh, a lot of these modern frameworks um, like Next and SvelteKit and Gatsby and so on. So there's an interesting thing, thing to think about there. Uh, where does the, the templating um, happen where the data is injected into the markup? What you said, and this is a topic for another podcast, but what you said is just giving me some Gutenberg vibes uh, right. about, <laughs> exactly. uh, you know, what the modern, the modern way of uh, doing this and, and what you want to do, you want to be able to get JSON. You mentioned XML. I don't want to have to look at XML or get that ever, sure. but uh, JSON works for me. And uh, uh, yeah, that's just... It, there are many different approaches, and I feel like while we all want to say that the way that everyone does it now is through JSON, that's not the way uh, that it's done yeah. all over, right? Yeah, and that's that's not to say you can't build a modern app with the approach where you, you stream down HTML. Like some good example are in the Ruby on Rails community. They have like uh, Turbo Links, for example, uh, and then the in the Fixer and the Phoenix and Elixir community, they have another solution for this where they're on the fly streaming HTML and inserting that into the DOM. So uh, it doesn't yeah. mean you can't build web, web you know, uh, nice web experiences like that. But generally speaking, I think the JSON is the preferred approach these days. Yeah, I was actually just going to comment on that, that like, I know my experience, like I came in, I mean, I started doing web dev when I was like a kid, but I actually started working in it and learning it like early React days. So I missed the whole Ruby on Rails thing. And I was actually thinking about the other day, I should probably go, you know, check that out and see, see if there's lessons to be learned there. I'm sure there are. Um, mm. But like, that even just still applies to like general, like lead generation kind of sites, like a lot of um, you know, client, yeah, general consumer facing, you know, content driven sites where like the things people want to be doing and like, you know, you know, Grafana and their, their crazy, you know, data streaming dashboards or like, I've never, I have no idea what web developers that create ads do. Cause I'm sure it looks nothing like the web development I do. That's a whole nother like subcategory of web sure. development that looks very, very different. Mm -hmm. And um, I think to some degree, a lot of these conversations like still apply that we're having, but it would be interesting to hear like those different perspective and how that would uniquely apply to different um, corners of web development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. Well, next, uh, let's just talk about uh, how does one choose? Because um, we've talked about a lot of different uh, methods here. And uh, the annoying answer, I think, for all of our listeners is, of course, it depends, right, on what the project is and what the needs needs are for the site. Um, you know, Alex and Will, you know, do you two have any general rules? You know, would you say if the site has X, then I would gravitate toward Y, you know, or if it has one thing, I would seriously consider the certain approach. Yeah, I I tend to think about uh, you know, what do you want from a business standpoint? If you're building a personal site, then it's like, what are you in for? Do you want to just go all the way and try to optimize your site to the nth degree just because you know you're doing it for fun or something? Uh, but if you have a business, you really have your goal is not necessarily to, you know build the most complicated site out there your your goal is to sell a product to people uh so you might have to take some trade-offs because like i said everyone wants to uh take advantage of all these new technologies and and a lot of things are almost there and and i'm sure you know once we get over the hill of uh, you know this dpr or, or whatever like that will become easier but then there will be another thing on the horizon that is kind of that extra edge that some people go to. So I think it always depends from a business standpoint about how much time you want to invest and how much money you want to invest in building your web application or your, uh, you know, whatever application you're building. Mm -hmm. And uh, and for a lot of people, I think that the answer is still um, your marketing website. Uh, or your brochure type marketing site that with that, you need to consider uh, a lot of the static site generation and, and some of the core web vitals. Um, and so for that, you do want to optimize. If you 
uh, have a web application that your subscribers or your, your actual customers are using, uh, maybe you do not need to go to the full extent of building static sites and, and all of this, and you can get away with just a client side, uh, rendered application. Hmm. Yeah. I, I think it's interesting as I've gotten more and more senior and thought about these things more, the less I care about the tech the more I care yeah. about the business use. And mm -hmm. I, I think from the technical perspective to add, add to everything Will said, which was excellent, is get choose technology that give you options, right? So if, uh, you know, Gatsby is great, I love it, but I can either do build time, I can do static side generation, or I can do client side. Like, and now people complain about Gatsby all the time because they think it only does they only think about it in the context of the static site generation, but the reality is Google's or Google, uh, Gatsby's entire cloud, cloud platform is built on Gatsby, they're, mm -hmm. right? They're drinking their own champagne there. Like it, it's client side rendering. You can do, it's React, you can do that. Um, but at the same time, you don't have an SSR aspect. Like if, if that plays better to your app or your situation, you might just have to choose next just because of that, you know? and if, theoretical world, it would be great if you could choose a single framework and it gave you all these options. Um, you know, so mm -hmm. for me, like, I really like Svelte. I've been digging that lately. And Svelte Kit does this generally really well is uh, like I mentioned earlier, like you can choose SSR, you can choose SSG, like um, you can, you can full up disable hydration and client side routing. So right. Right. You can choose whether, you know, cert, like, and you can even do this cool thing where you say, when you load this page, don't hydrate it. Don't load all this JavaScript. So your page load goes from like two megs to like two kilobytes, right? It's just HTML and CSS. So when you click on a link, you do have that like server delay, like, because it has to reach out to the server and do a fetch. But if somehow you got into the app through a different route, that did load that client side rendering stuff, then it will do that hydration because all of that's already there. So the same route oh, wow. will Sweet. actually be rendered two completely different ways based on how you came to it, which is like, that's really cool for like uh, landing pages from ads, let's say. Like yeah. you probably just wanna get that up there as fast and not ship them you know, anything you don't have to. But if the person already is using your, you know, your paid application or whatever they already have that hydration that's happened, then great, just do that. And that's a better experience for, in both mm -hmm. contexts. Um, you know, and that, and that extends out not just to route based, but like in Gatsby's context, right? In a lot of companies' context, they, they, they have that marketing site and they have the application. And it's not always the right decision to put those into the same framework and, and you know, back end application, but mm -hmm. that is, one way to optimize, you know, if you have not a lot of devs or whatever, like right, is including those both in a single application. And as long as that application framework lets you do what you need on both sides. Um, and yeah, yeah. so um, uh, server side components for, for React will be huge in, in that stream is that it enables Gatsby and Next right. both to, to open up a different things there. So right. yeah, that's, to summarize that, choose what gives you the most options. So when your business case changes, you can change without rebuilding your entire site. Yeah. Yeah. Good advice. Uh, a few from my end, uh, for, for listeners, I, I would say, um, it's almost always the right decision to not make the user wait for things might seem obvious to say, but just, uh, you know, anything you can offload and, and do it, do it at build time, or maybe do it, uh, I, it it can still happen on the client, but maybe it's it happens in the background so that the user doesn't even you know realize that that it's happening. Uh, that results in better perceived performance, you know. So um, instead of the user visiting the site and then them w waiting around while while data is fetched from a database and then templating happens and then a response comes back and finally they can see the data, you know, instead um, pre-compile if you can as much of that ahead of time so that they're. And, and distribute those HTML files across the CDN, uh, if at all possible. So they get a very quick initial page load. And then um, what's on the client, as I said, as long as they can, you know, start, start uh, making sense of what's on the page, start reading, interacting, whatever, um, you can even do more rendering at that point, right? You can make a request in the background to get a, you know, a, a certain uh, stock ticker, um, 
value or something and update it a portion of the page without the user having to having to wait for that. So I'd say that's almost always the um, the right choice to kind of defer defer things so that the user doesn't have to wait for them. We mentioned Core Web Vitals; it'll also help you there. You know, you just get better better speed scores if you choose to do that. Another one is um, uh, you need, as it stands right now, you need some kind of um, server rendered page if you want your con content to be uh, SEO friendly and indexed by, by Google. So I would just keep that in mind if you're building something like uh, you know, a blog or a publication or something for your company and you want Google to, to crawl those and index those pages, uh, then choose something you know, where you do get a, a server rendered document. Don't go don't go for create react app or something like that, that does strictly, you know, client side rendering. And that goes to, you know, Alex's comments about choosing a, a framework or some technology that's flexible enough, you know? So if you, um, if you do need, you know, if you do need uh, some client side rendering, then that's fine. If you, if you chose something like Gatsby or Next.js or Spellkit, it could of course handle that, but you also have the benefit of the SEO friendly uh, initial load with some of those frameworks as well. So they, they're a good blend, I think, of some of those things. So I think that's all, uh, all my thoughts. Um, let's, let's wrap things up uh, here. Uh, first off, like Alex, just want to thank you for coming on the show. It's been fun geeking out about this stuff, um, talking about all different ways where rendering has, has gone, you know, in the it would be built in space so over the years and where things are currently. Uh, so yeah. thanks for being on with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm, I've been biting my tongue this whole time because I really want to talk about the, the cool stuff Gatsby's doing, but uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, we'll have to come back and do that another time. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll count on that. Do, a, do another episode and you can, you know, uh, divulge all that stuff without spilling, spilling the beans. We'll call it gushing. <laughs> Gush over mm -hmm. it. That's exciting. Any Gatsby fans out there, stay tuned for more. All right, we'll wrap things up. Uh, thanks again for uh, being on with us, Alex. Thanks everybody for tuning in. We'll catch you in the next episode.